All right, students, welcome back to Chapter 7, Development Strategies. Two terms you may be familiar with, Web 2.0 and Cloud Computing. Depending on how old you are, you might not remember or have ever experienced Web 1.0 or just the World Wide Web. Web 2.0, this is the second generation, this is a very interactive internet. These are, you know, this is the YouTubes, Google Docs, uh, Wikipedia, podcasting, really two-way conversations between the user and the internet, which really turn into hundred-way conversations between many, many users. Prior to this, back in my dial-up days, the internet was a very one-way conversation. You would go to a site, you would ingest whatever it was, a, a news site or maybe a personal site, and that was it. That was the extent of your interaction. You might have been able to leave a comment, um, and then that would go directly to a server that the website administrator may or may not actually read. There really wasn't much interaction unless you dialed into a specific BBS, bulletin board system, uh, it, it just wasn't the web that we have today. Um, the key takeaway though is Web 2.0 is very, very interactive and it emphasizes user generated content. And then, of course, cloud computing. Anybody who uses Google Docs is using cloud computing. If you have a Google Chrome device, a Chrome laptop, for example, that is entirely cloud computing. All of, all of your data, or at least the vast majority of it, is in the cloud. It's on, quote unquote, somebody else's computer. Um, all of the applications you get, you're pulling from the web. You're using Google Docs. That program isn't on your computer like Microsoft Word lives on mine. And of course, riding on the coattails of Web 2.0, are our mobile devices. Back in the day when we had Palms, Palm Pilots, I had an M130, you know, we were just touching the cusp of using the internet in a handheld form. There weren't many apps catered to online. If you had a browser, you had to suffer with using a desktop web page and you'd have to, you know, scroll left or right to see the entire page. Pages couldn't be rebuilt to the smaller screens of mobile devices. Now, the vast majority of the web is built solely for smartphones and tablets. A lot of services only cater to cell phones, and they only cater on the application. Think of uh, sites like Uber. Uh, you're only going to use that on your cell phone. So we need apps for these devices. We need specific programs that allow the user to interact with a business, to purchase items, to comment, and to call on different services. Anytime we are tasked with developing some sort of software, we we'll always want to think, is this something that we can do ourselves, 100%? Can we build this? Should we buy it from a large corporation, maybe Sun Microsystems, maybe Cisco, uh, or any other organization that specializes in specialty software? Or is can we do a hybrid approach? Can we buy a software package and cater it to our needs? Regardless of the path you know, we, we need to look at TCO, Total Cost of Ownership. It's not just about the upfront price of the package. What is our maintenance? What is our fees? Is there a subscription? Is there a user fee per individual? You know, right now, if your company has 75 people, that might be manageable. But as you grow, you're going to need more, need to buy more licenses. That can become expensive. If we look at this little flow chart here, you kind of see the idea. Uh, in the early stages, we're going to have planning and analysis. You know, this is where we're going to put up what requirements do our users need? What limitations do we have to work with? You might start talking briefly about budget. You know, this is our, you know, five-year expenditure for this, 10-year expenditure for this. And then we really need to sit down and figure out, well, do we make and build this or do we just purchase something? A lot of people and a lot of organizations just, I hate to say going the easy way, but there are a lot of 
commercial packages out there that can do uh, you know various different things and you're probably going to find something that's going to suit your organization however you might be doing a very niche project or you might be in a unique field where you need to develop in-house software to do exactly what you need to do can you do that completely do you, does your organization have the the skill set ability and the time to build something in-house or do we do a hybrid approach and we do customized software and that's where you would team up with an outside entity bring in your own engineers and say all right well, we're going to purchase x percent of this system because that's what we need to do we're going to have our engineers and our, our software individuals program the rest of it and you kind of work together passing code back and forth to make sure that you can customize exactly what you need and then finally implementation let's get this out to the users let's train them put that on our servers and actually hit the green light so we all can start using this Let's look at each of these options a little bit deeper. If we develop something in-house, obviously that's going to satisfy whatever unique business requirements we have. Uh, for example, my company, we do government contracting. So there are some very unique things we do that we can't go to the civilian sector to purchase software just because it's, it's not out there. there. There is no software niche that does what we need. So a lot of times we have to build in-house software. Um, Obviously, you know, hey, it's not standard, right? So it works only with our systems, only in our uh, our specific labs that we use it. This can cause issues if we expand. Sometimes even if we upgrade hardware, it may be built specifically for the hardware we have in hand. And the big thing about this is we can grow and shrink the scope of this to meet the constraints of what we're working with. We know what hardware we have. You know, if we're all using, you know, Lenovo T495s, I know the capability of that system. And I know it's only going to run on a T495. So there's your system specs. We don't need to have it be able to read different types of hardwares, no different graphics card. It's only going to work on this, period. So it makes that a little bit easier, right? Um, this isn't exactly always the, the cheapest route. Um, cause think you, you're paying your in-house software developers and that's, well, the bang for the buck is as good as those people are. And in this industry, your developers usually are as only good as you can pay them. If you have more of a budget to push towards software development, more often than not, you get better software developers. On the other hand, when we buy a software package, it's low cost. This is a polished product that the rest of the public is using. We can go go to a store go on amazon go to that publisher's website buy it and implement it that day once you get the installation you just put it on the systems and go we don't need to have software programmers engineers in-house to take care of this if there are issues just call them up if it's an adobe product call up adobe these are my issues they'll take care of it you also get upgrades too uh, i know this is kind of a, a sticky point depending on what software you're using nowadays but it is general to expect at least a year or two of upgrades for any software that you're using the nice thing about this though is a lot of software manufacturers think of any program you use any piece of software you're using whether it's on your phone or on your computer there's always some sort of way to give feedback to the developer you know did this program crash well let's send some feedback data uh, is there a feature you don't really like about it? We can have a communication with the developer to say, you know, hey, this button really doesn't work or these features don't work. So you get a large community of, um, you know, quote unquote testers to help refine and kind of push this software to, to become better, to have better features, to be more useful. You could do that with in-house developing, but again, that's going to be expensive. And it's only with the people who use it. If you only have 30 people that are going to use your in-house development, well, that's only 30 people looking at it, and you're probably not going to get a lot of meaningful um, upgrade, uh, upgrade suggestions. And of course, we can always customize something. And this is where you really need to sit down with different vendors. Hey, how much can I customize? Sometimes they don't let you see all of the source code. 
Sometimes they won't even let you change any of the code to it. You would tell them your requirements, they will build it. Of course, it's on their budget and their schedule. You might be able to bring your programmers into it where you would buy most of the program, your programmers would develop the unique features that you need, send it back to that original vendor for their quality check just to make sure everything works, and then you have the package. Support with this was hit and miss though, right? Because even though it was developed by a, a reputable vendor who is probably making more commercial off-the-shelf programs right now, yours is unique. So you might be stuck with a lot of the help desk and a lot of the IT support for that program. So that's something you really need to keep in mind. Another way to cut cost is outsourcing. And this doesn't necessarily mean to overseas. I think that's a, a stigma when we talk about outsourcing. But in IT, really it just means that we are taking certain processes, system development, operation, maintenance, uh, even hosting, we're taking that to somebody else with better expertise, uh, better systems, better equipment to do it for us. We don't have to have an in-house IT department. We don't, sometimes we don't even have to have servers in our facility anymore. All of that is taken care of somewhere else. We can have another company develop software for us, for our users to enjoy. It sounds great. It is, it is a cost savings benefit, but this adds another level of complexity because it's not your company, right? If you had your in-house programmers and you had issues with this software development, well, you, you can just walk down the hall to them circle the wagon and say, all right, well, but what's going on here? Do we need more resources? Do we need more money? What? Why are we not getting the results we need? When you're developing with a outside entity that you've outsourced to them, that gets tricky. That gets difficult. It gets slow. There's also security concerns with this as well, especially if they are not only developing your software, but they're hosting your data. It's one thing for a malicious individual or organization to hack one company and get their data. But if we are hacking IT companies who are doing cloud-based serving, who are doing software development for many different companies, well, the, the pot's a little sweeter for them to go after those IT groups than individual organizations. So if software security is a concern, it's probably best to have everything in-house, servers, development, uh, and all the requisite knowledge for that. It is more expensive, but it can be more secure. We have three different types of payment model when we outsource it. We have a fixed fee where you're paying X, X dollars a month, period, and this is the services you're getting. If you want more, too bad, maybe we'll have to go up to a, a more premium tier. We can do a subscription model where you have a variable fee based on the number of users you have. This is incredibly popular and, and it makes a lot of sense, right? Because if you have if you have 20 users, I have 100 users, well, I should probably be paying more because I my users would demand more than your 20. And of course, usage model. This is usually more fair, but it's harder to compute because your fee varies, right? You might not have a lot of users one month. You might hire more people, then it goes up, or they may adjust a um, an extra charge and how many trouble tickets were open. This can get very tricky. Uh, it can become very expensive. But the thing I don't like about the usage model is it's very hard to project your end of year finances. Right. When you talk to your finance people, we need to know what our outputs are every month. Who am I paying and how much am I paying them? With a fixed fee or a subscription fee, I generally know either exactly what it is or within a few hundred dollars. With the usage model, who knows what that can be from month to month, depending on what wickets they use to, to change their billing. We really need to look at cost benefits for every one of these options. And then this is something you're going to be doing in early and mid-stage planning. And you're going to be sitting down with different departments. You're going to have IT there. You're going to have planning and development. You're going to have finances there. And you're really going to start nitpicking every single one of these. How much are we going to 
pay per month and in a 5, 10, 15 year scenario for in-house development if we bought it or if we did a hybrid approach. You, we really need to put a lot of attention into the reports that are prepared. And if you're the one making the report, you need to make sure that it's incredibly detailed and get as much information as you can in there because at the end of the day, it, it's about money when we're talking about organizations. Sometimes we don't have a lot of money to spend. And even though a off the shelf solution might not do everything we want it to do, it might be 80% and we'll make up the rest of that somewhere else. It's, it's frustrating, especially if you know you have the ability to build a better system, but if it's gonna cost more in the end, unfortunately, you're probably gonna lose that, that argument when it comes to finance. At the end of the day, companies need to be in the black. You know, we can't have excess debt, we can't have excess expenses. So it gets very difficult. But with a good, proper cost-benefit analysis, even if a system's more expensive, if it is better for the company in the long run, then you have a winning idea in your corner and you might be able to sell that and convince them to pay, pay a little more upfront for a quality piece of software that will last for a long time. Through all these meetings, the system analyst is going to be taking all kinds of different notes and creating a very thorough document, presentations, charts, graphs, the whole nine yards. That way, when we present this to management, we give them a very clear idea of what's going on. This is the software we need to do. These are the dip different routes that we can follow. Of course, we're gonna be talking about price with this, but we also need to talk about development time. If we buy something that is pre-built, this can be developed in the short term. If we fully develop everything in-house, it could take months, maybe years to get that. And we need to really explain the why for each one of these steps. Why do we want to outsource? Why do we want to buy software? Why do we want to build in-house? Present every single thing thoroughly and do it in a way where it's very clear and concise because sometimes when you're presenting to management, they don't have an IT background. They don't understand system development. So it needs to be presented in a way that anybody can understand. And finally, we're waiting on management's decision. Once they come up, the system analyst will start getting the wheels in motion. Do we need to implement an outsourcing alternative or are we developing in-house? How do we get this role and how do we start this project? Do we bring in project managers? Is this something that we can manage inside? We covered a lot here and honestly, I could have spent a lot more time on this, but Again, PowerPoints are just a brief overview, and we're already pushing 18 minutes so far. So please keep pushing. If you have any questions, please let me know.